I tell all veterans out there, you know, you're not in it alone. I thought I was, I struggled. I, I almost died, to be honest, from alcohol. Welcome to the podcast where we track down Australian war veterans, have a chat with them and hear their stories. I'm Alex Lloyd and this is Life on the Line. The only thing I was scared of was failing, was letting down the people there that I was supposed to support. Things went south really bad. You've got to have an element of crazy to be good at what we do. There was an ego attached to being a gunfighter. Being around big tall trees, thick shrubbery, there was a potential killer there. The story of transformation is powerful. Welcome to Life on the Line. This podcast is a conversation between Major Sharon Maskell Dare and Warrant Officer Class 1, Kelly Hammond. This was recorded a few months ago while Kelly was still in the Middle East in what was her 10th operational deployment. Kelly has served in the Australian Army for 24 years. She's deployed seven times to the Middle East area of operations, including once to Iraq and twice to Afghanistan. She's also deployed to Indonesia and twice on border protection. She's done exercises in Germany, France, Belgium, Holland and England. This is her chat with Sharon about her deployments, battle with alcoholism, overcoming adversity, mentoring young people, and the impact of COVID-19 on her most recent operational deployment. Kelly, thank you very much for joining us today on Life on the Line. No worries, Sharon. Good to be here. So look, I want to hear all about your background, Kelly, because you've had an incredible career with the Australian Army, right from when you grew up on Stradbrook Island, obviously then joined the military, and then you've had these extensive travels throughout the world. So tell us a bit about where you grew up. I was born in Brizzy and I moved over to beautiful Minjeriba, North Stradbroke Island, home of the Kwanamuka people. Um, and I pretty much lived there until I was 17 and I completed grade 12 with my identical twin sister Kim and we were just wondering what are we going to do with our lives so my sister decided to join the mines over there with the rest of my family and I decided to join the army straight out of school. 24 years later here I am. And how did that go down Kelly telling your family you were joining the army? They absolutely loved it like I had an uncle in the army but that's pretty much the only experience my family have had with the military so it was very scary because you know two young ladies coming from North Strati you tend to not get to see the real world so here I go jumping on a bus uh, in the middle of Brisbane city which I never really saw as a kid anyway. My mum and my sister waved me off and yeah it's been absolutely amazing experience. What was the training like then when you first uh, came to Army? Back in the day, I joined in 1996, so it was a little bit different to what it is now. It was pretty much a little bit harder, but we were all trained equally. I, I was in a platoon with, with young men as well, so we weren't segregated from women to men. Yeah, it was hard, but it was, it was fantastic. I prepared myself. I've always been fit. I love physical challenges. Yeah, I didn't find it very difficult at all, especially as a 17-year-old coming straight out of school and off an island. Was there nothing about it you found challenging? I mean, you obviously were pretty physically fit, but what about the reality of being away from home and, and leaving um, Stradbroke Island for the first time? Yeah, that was a pretty big challenge for me because, you know, being born an identical twin, I, I've always had someone next to me. I remember being on the bus and, I said, you know, to the day, I, I've never been anywhere other than North Stradbroke Island and driving all the way down to Albury, Wodonga and, and Wagga, those areas, I thought to myself, what have I gotten myself into? But at the same time, I was I was overly excited to get off Stratty and, and to learn something different with my life. I had a huge career, a huge life in front of me. I think I just thought about that aspect rather than missing my family. And yeah, it just it made me such a strong person and the person I am today. You mentioned about wanting to get out there and, and learn something new and you ended up becoming a, a logistician. So talk us through a little bit about the kind of education and the training that you've had to complete in order to have that role. 
So the Army does so many qualifications, it's unbelievable. I started off doing initial employment training as a store person, but throughout my career I've done diplomas in, in management, logistics, and at the moment I've almost finished my Masters in Logistics Management. I've got one more subject to go, and then I've, I've got a Masters, and you know that's not only a good thing for myself, but, but the Army allowed me to study for the last 24 years, which I never would have been able to achieve probably in a normal job back at home. And what is it about logistics that you enjoy? Because I think this is something that our listeners might find quite surprising because when we think about the army, we think about uniforms, we think about people with weapons, we think about weapons training. We tend to think a lot about infantry. We don't tend to think about the logistics piece and yet it's absolutely key to how the army rolls, isn't it? It is definitely like logistics. It's it's a huge beast in any company, especially the military. Always, always so busy. But the good thing is, is we learn a lot from the different capabilities and equipment. So I play with weapons every day. I play with ammunition. It's not just about providing the simple logistics that normal civilians will think. It's like going, ensuring that the infantry are good to go with weapons, ammunition, and whatever they need to go forward. So yeah, it's, it's, it's a huge job. I don't think a lot of people see what we actually do as logisticians, but yeah, I'm happy to be a loggy, definitely. You say you're happy to be a loggy. So was it actually a choice that you made to go into that particular trade? <laughs> I was going to talk about that, actually. No, it wasn't. So y- usually you would get an option. Um, it just depends on what's available at the time when you join the army. But I didn't have an option back then. I became a logistician and, and I've stuck with it because I, I see purpose in it. It can be a challenging job, most definitely. But I still enjoy it. Otherwise, I would have been out years ago. You mentioned it can be challenging. Has there been a particular instance or case study or story you can share with us from your years of experience that perhaps highlights some of the challenges that go with being a loggy? Every day is a challenge, really, especially over here right now. I'm working with the theatre communications group. So basically, I'm dealing with ICT equipment and communication equipment, which I generally wouldn't touch if I wasn't posted into a communication unit, which I am at the moment. So you got to get your head around the complexities of that type of equipment without any qualifications on understanding anything about the equipment, like identification, cataloging and and whatnot. And another good example is when I was back in Brisbane, I deployed with Shadow Group 1 in Tarankout, Afghanistan, and it was a new capability for defence. So it was a UAV straight from America. Like we deployed, we didn't have any fuel. It was all American type equipment. So we had to change our ways to make the equipment suitable for Australians. And it took us almost nine months to get it correct. That's a typical challenge that we usually face in defence, especially with new capability. Now, you just touched on there that you're serving on operations as we're doing this interview. And in fact, we won't name where you are, but you're in the Middle Eastern area of operations. And we'll talk about that in a moment. But before we get there, you have got an extensive deployment history. And in fact, you've served in the Middle East a number of times before. So take us back perhaps to that first time when you found that you were going to be deployed to the Middle East, you know, earlier on in your career. What was your reaction when you got that news? I was really scared because I was a lot younger back then and the location that I was going to, it wasn't a pretty location. But at the same time, I thought, I am not going to miss this opportunity. I really want to take it and I want to make the most of that particular deployment, especially in 2007. Prior to the Middle East, I had a few deployments. Like my first deployment was Opiri and Jaya in Indonesia in 1998 when I was with the 5th Aviation Regiment in Townsville. Uh, And then future deployments were border protection. So I had that deployment experience, but I never had the Middle Eastern experience. And yeah, 2007 changed the way I saw any deployment. You mentioned that 2007 was very much then a turning point for you. Talk us through the lead up to that deployment. Where were you based and how did you find out that you were going to be going off to Iraq? At the time I was posted to the hospital back in Brisbane and I got a very late notice opportunity. I think if I recall I had a week to be ready and within the week I was deployed. We stopped at Q8 and then straight into Iraq with 
a force level logistics asset deployment. And it was really my first deployment. I was a sergeant at the time. I didn't have too much combat or well, had no combat experience or and whatnot, only border protection. So I spent seven months in Camp Victory doing logistics. Yeah, it was a it was an amazing deployment, although very harsh because of some of the issues that happened back in Iraq. Yeah, when I got back, I, I struggled a lot. I turned to alcohol. In fact, I turned to alcohol for five years. I've become an alcoholic. I didn't know how to deal with it at the time. And I think back then we didn't have the support networks that we do now in the military, which is absolutely fantastic. Um, and it wasn't until uh, 2012, just prior to my next deployment, that I, I met my long-term partner, Tracy Thompson, who at the time was a uh, police officer in Brisbane. But now she's a, she works for Danila Dilba um, Indigenous Health Services in, in Darwin, and she's a Deadly Choices ambassador. Uh, she's also the first Indigenous female to ever captain the Australian Indigenous All-Stars. So it's fantastic that I met her. She helped me uh, go through some of the issues that I was facing. And nine years later, I have had a couple of slip-ups, but I have been alcohol-free and I've, I've changed my life completely thanks to her. What an incredible experience there, Kelly. And thanks for sharing that with our listeners. I mean, clearly there must have been some adversity you were exposed to in Iraq or indeed there was some experiences there which clearly made their mark on you. Yeah, it, it definitely did. Like each day was a brand new day and I, I didn't know whether like we were going to survive or, or it, it was our time up. It was just, it was one of those deployments where things were always happening and your brain just didn't stop 24-7. The way I see the deployment back then to the deployments I've done more recently is the help, it's support. I tell all veterans out there, you know, you're not in it alone. I thought I was, I struggled. I, I almost died, to be honest, from alcohol until I got that support that I needed. And I will never look back now. I will never be that person that I used to be because I got help. So for people listening to the program that perhaps aren't familiar with what was happening back in Iraq at that time, you're referring back to 2007. What was the threat environment like at that time? It was high, like there were IDF almost every second day. IDF, or indirect fire, is when the person firing does not have a direct line of sight to the target. Think mortars, rockets or artillery. There were IDF almost every second day when we were over there. And it's just one of those things, you, you didn't know if your time was up. I remember I always walked to the gym and walked to work the exact same time, the exact time way. Because if I changed my path or my timings, I didn't know if it was going to be my time up. And that's the sort of things that go into your head when you're in such a threat environment. You, you just, you don't know. Hopefully people listening out there, I just, I just want to send that message that, you know, if you're in or if you were in the same boat as me, you, you just got to ask for help. And it sounds like when you came back to Australia, Kelly, that you did ask for help and you did reach out and that help came to you. Oh, yeah, definitely. And look, it wasn't easy and it still isn't easy. 2007 was such a long time ago and it, I do still struggle sometimes, but it's such a better world out there when I know that I have issues and I, and I deal with those issues. And Tracy's been a big part of that and, and my family back home at Stratty, they all finally understand what I went through and, and how I've overcome those issues. And it, honestly, it makes you such a stronger person. And then I look back now and I think, why couldn't I be that person now than, than I was back in 2007 when you know, I almost lost my whole life because I just didn't know how to deal with things. It's an interesting point that you raised there, Kelly. I mean, if you could send a message now with all the experience you now have, and we'll fast forward in a moment to some of the achievements that you've made since then, what message would you send back to yourself as you were in 2007? To look forward, get that help that you need. You're a stronger person than you think you are and do not turn to alcohol to solve any problems because the alcohol, as we all know, is a depressant and it only made it a hundred times worse. So stay strong. So you did stay strong, Kelly. You came back to Australia and you obviously sought the help that you needed to move on with your life. 
And then indeed, you've continued to have a, a very successful army career since then. So tell us about some of the other experiences that you've had, in particular, perhaps some of those other deployments. Uh, yeah, so 2012 was my turning point and it was also my deployment with, with Shadow Group, as I mentioned before. And it was easy. Like I spent nine months in Afghanistan. It was easy. I didn't think about the past issues that I had. When there was IDF, I knew how to deal with it. And I, I just stayed so focused and so strong that I came back and I was able to do more deployments in 2014, last year and again this year. So I love deployments. I love the military and I know how to be that strong person and that I need to be for myself and for my family and, and for my partner. And I'm intrigued to know a bit about how you've managed to master that deployment experience, Kelly, because I know from my own experience of having served in Iraq back in 2016 to 2017, I found the separation from my family really challenging. But it sounds like you've obviously found some ways to remain resilient and, and where it's very much become part of your professional life that you do go overseas. Yeah, I, I love the terminology resilience. It's, it's a big, huge part of my life. I actually did some studies on resilience during my masters and, and how to become more resilient because that's what the military is it, it's turning into like we do resilient training it's not adventurous training anymore it's resilience training and every rank it doesn't matter what rank you are everyone needs a, a form of resilience especially today with all the deployments and the locations of deployments I love the person that I am today. Like I'm physically fit. I've changed from being an alcoholic to just love my fitness. I love running. Like I, I run 20 k's a day over here. Probably wouldn't run that much if the gym was open, but that's another story. I'm just so head focused. I've almost finished my master's, which I never even thought for a second that I'd start studying because school back in my day, yeah, is you just attend it. Doesn't matter. Like I almost I failed home home economics. So, but I was good at PE. I'm just right now. I think the older I am, the more driven I am to better myself. And I only did my master's to improve myself as a logistician in the military. But that degree can get me so much further. I mean, I'm only 42. I'm not due to retire anytime soon. So people just need to set themselves a goal. And I always say this, I do a um, community engagement activity with some Indigenous schools back in Darwin, the STARS Foundation. And I always say to the girls before we start an activity is you've got to set yourself a goal. And if you want to achieve that goal, just follow it. You need Need to be resilient girls it's it's a harsh world out there so i always say that before we start an activity such as i take them through the obs course or we do some jump off the tower their fear they've got so much fear in them before you actually tell them you know you can achieve this if i can do it so can you and at the end of the day all the girls achieve that task and it, it's the same with any person you just got to follow your goal and you will succeed most definitely it sounds like inspiring other younger women in particular is really important to you, Kelly. Tell us a bit more about that and why that matters to you so much. I only just started feeling that way in Darwin 2018 when I took over as an Indigenous Liaison Officer for the STARS Foundation and I thought to myself, you know, I look at the young girls and some of them have come from really harsh backgrounds and I think to myself, geez, I've been there. I haven't been there as a child, I've been there as an adult back in 2007 where you just feel like like you don't have a life and you can't achieve anything. You're in such misery that you can't even look forward. And I always think to myself, I'm going to build these girls' resilience. I don't want anyone to go through the same pain that I went through back then. I want young girls to grow up into intelligent women, strong women. And it's not just women, it's the men as well. Like we see a lot of, especially our veterans, have so much issues and we all need to get together. We all need to help each other out and, and just stay strong and, and be positive. And this year is particularly, we all need to be together due to COVID. Everyone's starting to struggle over here because we haven't had a break. We don't get to go home for a period of up to seven months. So, you know, we're starting to do activities together just to, to change our way of living over here. You touched earlier on the fact that the gym's closed, which is often when you're on deployment where people go to blow off a bit of steam and, and have a bit of time to themselves. But if it's closed, then obviously you can't do that. So how else has COVID had an impact on, on your experience on deployment on this occasion compared to your previous deployment history? Uh, COVID has actually changed everything over here, like from a personal way to the way we operate in our working environment as well. Like as a loggy, 
COVID's put a lot of restrictions on, on getting equipment in and out, personnel in and out. We have to be in quarantine. The hardest part, and I just did a case study on this with um, leadership, the, the, I think the hardest challenge that we're all facing is, is the social distancing requirements, especially when we're living in communal areas. Like sometimes it's, it's almost impossible to have that social distancing, uh, living the way we are over here. But I think we're doing pretty well as a whole over here. And it, it's due to the leadership and those that want to make change for everyone rather than just procrastinating on the fact that, you know, there's no gym. You can always do other things around gym and whatnot. Like, as I said earlier, I, I run 20Ks and it's like 46 degree heat over here, but I still do it because like you said, Sharon, it clears the mind. And that's the only reason why I remain so focused over here is because at the end of the day, I go for like a 10K run in the afternoon, a 10K run in the morning, just to clear my head and recuperate from all the challenges as a logistician that I've had during the day. And it does work. Like people think I'm crazy over here, but really I'm, I'm just doing what I need to do. I bet they also admire your fitness, Kelly. It sounds like you're super fit right now. <laughs> oh, I wouldn't go that far. Although we did have a team challenge uh, last week and I'm pretty sure I was the older. So I always want to compete against uh, young people, especially the men. When I'm in front of them, I, I do chuckle to myself sometimes. But yeah, it's really good. It's, it boosts the morale, that's for sure. So morale's good from the sounds of it, because obviously that would be the obvious question that listeners might ask given the whole COVID situation. Yeah, morale's always good, well, especially for me, because it's what I make out of it. Like some days, like, we all have our ups and downs and, and thinking, oh my God, we've been stuck on base for four months now, you know, no normality, but it's what you make of it. And I always say to my younger soldiers, deployments are what you make of it. You can be lazy, you can sit in your room, not get fit, not socialise, not meet new people, or you you can have the most amazing deployment that you've ever, ever experienced. So get out and about, do some PT and start networking. Get to understand what other people do, like the RAF and Navy. Army don't usually, you know, we don't mingle enough, but on deployments, we all have to work together and we work so differently that it's amazing. I, I love seeing what the, the other services do and, and how we can improve on our processes in the Army. Now, you told us earlier that you'd had a long career in the Australian Army, 24 years, I think, is what it adds up to right now. So when you do get back to Australia, how do you see the rest of your army career panning out, particularly with some of the great work you're obviously doing around mentoring young people, particularly in the Indigenous community, and also your work that, and also with your interest in veterans? Yeah, look, I definitely want to continue on with community engagement, hopefully in the Brisbane region. I just love doing it from a personal point of view. I'd love to continue it back down in Brizzy. And for the veterans, I always want to volunteer and get involved to help anyone out, really. That's just my thing. And now that I won't be studying next year, I'm just I'm not sure what to do with my weekends. But once I get this master's, I'll probably look at, because I'm a Y1 now, I can't really go much further. I'd probably look at transfer to become an officer, perhaps a quartermaster. So it sounds like there's still some ambition there then, Kelly. Oh, definitely. I reckon I've got about 19 years left of my career, for sure. That's pretty dedicated. Thank you. So Warrant Officer Class 1, Kelly Hammond, thank you so much for sharing with us your story of resilience and, frankly, hard work and utter dedication. And I'm sure that many young people listening to this would be inspired by your story. Uh, thank you, Sharon. It's been an absolute pleasure. You've been listening to Life on the Line, and I'm Sharon Maskeldare. That was Sharon Maskeldare's conversation with Warrant Officer Class 1, Kelly Hammond. For another veteran story with a vivid description of receiving indirect fire and the after effects of that, listen to an interview with an Iraq veteran at the start of this season. Number 76, Sarah Watson. We came under indirect fire, just hearing these booms. It was chaos. In season three, 2019, listen to Angus Horden's conversation with an artillery forward observer from the Vietnam War in number 46, John Wells. And one of the really hard things about it was that having to stay on edge in case it's 99% boredom, but you've got to be ready for that 1% that's not. And jump back to season two, 2018, and listen to Sharon Maskell Dare's conversation with an Afghanistan veteran of the artillery corps. Number 37, Scott Calvert. 12 hour mission, 10 hours in contact, being surrounded 360 degrees, but at all stages knowing that you had the firepower. 
for an insightful conversation about how the Australian Defence Force is grappling with COVID-19. Listen to my Season 4 bonus episode with the three-star general in command of the domestic response in COVID-19 Task Force with John Fruin. Unfortunately, with what's been going on in Victoria, we're now right back to very intense activities. This is very much a fight on the home front. To hear Sharon's story of service, including her deployment to Iraq, check out her interview with me in Season 3. Number 45, Dr Sharon Maskeldare. Everyone who deploys, who has a family, knows. It's a reality that you are away from the people that you love. And for more conversations between Sharon and members of Joint Task Force 633, interviewed while on deployment to the Middle East, listen to the Season 4 episodes, number 83, Dean and Alan Bretherton. Two of my uncles had lost their eyes, one to infection and one to shrapnel. Everybody got behind each other and spurned each other on. Number 86, Susan Coyle. You have to be resilient to be able to cope in any environment. Number 89, Zion Connors. It certainly helped me find my identity as an Indigenous man in the Defence Force. And number 91, Leslie Carney. Also knowing that I've got the training and a mindset that one switches to so that one is always on the alert, one is always in the back of the mind ready there trained to take over to do what one has to do. Follow this podcast at Life on the Line Podcast on Instagram and Facebook and at LOTL Pod on Twitter. Our website is www.lifeonthelinepodcast.com. Life on the Line is brought to you by Thistle Productions. Artwork by Big Cat Design. Music by Dan Van Werkhoven. Thanks for listening. And lest we forget.